Cyberpunk 2077. A name that, until recently, moistened the pantaloons of any gamer who heard those sultry syllables. A legendary game by a legendary developer. Many players believe that this would herald in a new age of gaming, a glimmering ray of hope in an otherwise bleak year. So when it turned out that the game gargled man gravy and gave out two for one toss jobs out the back of a Burger King, was it simply a perfect storm of misfortune? Or does the old adage ring true once again? You either die a hero or, li or live long live long enough to see yourself become worse, uh, not as good as you used to be. This is the story of Cyberpunk 207077. CD Projekt Red was founded in Poland in May of 1994, and after a few years of things that are very difficult to write jokes about, like game distribution and localization, they decided to create their first original game. The Witcher, based on a book series about a man who kills monsters and not witches, was released to international acclaim. The satisfactory release allowed them to chase a squeakquel, the bizarrely titled The Witcher 2, which released to critical praise and critical pay. <laughs> CDPR learnt a lot through the development of their first two titles. In particular, how much they hate dealing with publishers who were constantly stifling their creative vision. Following The Witcher 2, CDPR was to be completely self-published, affording them the ability to take their time, finally craft quality experiences, and try risky endeavors like releasing a game as a buggy, unplayable mess. Oh shit! This self-published mantra paid off big time with The Witcher 3, considered by many, myself included, to be one of the greatest games of all time. In addition to a fantastic core game, the two expansions were equally amazing, if not more so, and sold for the same price that most games would sell you a particularly pleasant PNG of a hat. In an industry forever content to swindle as much cash from you as possible, CDPR was a shiny example, and supporting them felt like giving a middle finger to every loot box ridden, addiction loop inducing publisher who had long since sold their souls so their CEO could afford another Lamborghini Spaghettio. This in addition to their scrappy underdog persona, proved to their peers that you can sell a game without having to milk every facet of it like some kind of grotesque tit monster and still come out on top. The Witcher 3 put the company on the gaming map. A map soaked in Mountain Dew and weighed down with an anime body pillow, but a map nonetheless, and the gaming public hotly anticipated the company's next move. Let's take a step back. Cyberpunk's development started in 2012 with a small crew of around 50 Witcher 1 and 2 veterans. This early development was mostly pre-production, including world building, game design, and beginning the long and arduous task of perfecting the eyeshadow of their female love interest. In May, at the CDPR Summer Conference, a game simply titled Cyberpunk was first announced, set in the world of, well, Cyberpunk, a pen and paper RPG created by Mike Pondsmith. In this presentation, they promised us the world, swept us off our feet, and fingered us under the moonlight. A varied selection of character classes, advanced RPG mechanics, and a new standard in the futuristic RPG genre. It wasn't until October that we learnt of the title, Cyberpunk 2077, which astute viewers out there will notice the date the game is set in. And the year I bet you thought the game was gonna come out, am I right fellow YouTube commenters? <laughs> At this point, The Witcher 3 had yet to set the world on fire, and these announcements mostly went under the radar of the general public. After the world was unfortunately not destroyed in 2012, 2013 slithered out like the slimy serpent that it is, and gifted us with the now famous teaser trailer. While pre-rendered and therefore useless at telling us what the game is actually about, it at least promised a flashy dystopian world, human augmentation, intense violence, and the ability to shoot women, a feature gamers had been requesting for years. The trailer cockily announces it will be released when it's ready. Which it... Uh... There was also a hidden message tagged onto the end that announces a bold claim that the game is aiming to be finished in 2015. And then... 
that was it. Their ambitious 2015 date came and went, and it would take until 2016 for us to get even a lick of new information. We now know that the rationale behind the 2015 release date was that they actually planned to have a full development team working in tandem with The Witcher 3. But this didn't prove viable, and so they left their main team of a few hundred to shack up with Geralt and co, while the spooky scary skeleton crew continued work on Cyberpunk. This shift in focus to The Witcher 3 explains why they released a teaser trailer in 2013, literally five years before the next one in 2018, and why the game was in development for so long. After a delay from quarter three of 2014 to February 2015, and again to May 2015, The Witcher 3 finally exploded onto the scene. After scooping up awards like your average YouTuber scoops up pedophilic accusations, spirits were riding high at CDPR. According to this financial statement from 2019, they had made an estimated $1 billion and the two subsequent expansions only further cemented the game's legacy. Like a cow in a catapult, the stakes were raised and all eyes were now on the Polish developer. While a good chunk of the team stayed on The Witcher to tidy off the expansions in 2016, a majority of the team finally joined the small crew piloting the SS Cyberpunk. And like a squatting contest at the International Builders Convention, here's where the cracks begin to show. Head of studio Adam Badowski took over as the game's director and began to make sweeping changes to gameplay and story, such as the controversial move to first person and the removal of the dedicated queef button. Leads who had come over from The Witcher 3 would often clash with Mike Wazowski over these changes, to the point that several of them quit the company entirely. In Cyberpunk 2017, CDPR managed to shanghai $7 million from a Polish government grant that aimed to drive game development within the country so that Poland could finally be known for more than just uh, they submitted four proposals for this grant, all seemingly for cyberpunk, which were city creation, animation excellence, cinematic feel, and seamless multiplayer. Their money certainly went to good use. Sort of. With no new cyberpunk info in over four years, and a flurry of new Witcher 3 fans scouring the internet for any scrap of information, people began trawling through the reviews of employees and ex-employees on workplace review website Glassdoor. CDPR has very mixed reviews, most of which resonate the same key points. Great staff and talent, good perks, but poor pay and exceptionally top-heavy management that left developers feeling ignored when it came to design decisions and realistic expectations of delivery times. Eager to get ahead of any speculation surrounding the state of the game inferred from these reviews, CDPR put out a rare statement in late 2017, addressing worker dissatisfaction. It reads more as a motivational piece about how anything is possible with enough commitment and spirit and smooches and does little to address the actual issues put forward by employees. Regardless, we are assured that Cyberpunk is progressing as planned, and that silence is the cost of making a great game. And oppressive work conditions. 2018, after five years of no trailers and only scraps of information peeled from the underside of tangentially related articles, we finally got our first proper glimpse into the world of Night City. This trailer was introduced in spectacular fashion. At the very end of the Xbox presentation at E3, VP of Gaming at Microsoft, Phil Spencer, was assassinated live on stage. And the hacker known as 4chan hijacked the presentation, uploading the Cyberpunk 2077 trailer, and the crowd lost their fucking minds. It was an amazing trailer, showcasing in-game graphics, introducing us to our main character V, short for Vaginald, and showing us a lot more of what we'll actually be doing in the game, compared to the 2013 teaser. However, they did miss the part where you have to quick load five times because an enemy keeps seeing you stealth through a wall somehow, and the six to eight minute Pan Am gawking segments. This trailer also featured a hidden message, reiterating that they would only release the game when it's ready, and that quality is the only thing that drives them. A flashy two minute trailer wouldn't be the only thing we were treated to at E3 2018. CDPR also slapped a fucking 48 minute gameplay trailer on us, in the same way that I slapped down my monster hog on the table when it's time for business. 
For what it's worth, a significant portion of the missions shown are actually more or less accurate to what's in the game. Of course, as with most E3 walkthrough demos, the quality is noticeably better than the missions preceding it. Many people have labelled this trailer as fake, and while it probably would dissolve pretty quickly if you really tried to go off-road, it appears to be a real build that the media was allowed to playtest behind closed doors. While this trailer mentioned multiple times that it was a work in progress and to get those expectations down off the damn kitchen counter, it also implied an exceptional amount of freedom and player agency. And game is stiffies and, um, labia were through the roof. This was fantastic from a marketing perspective, but developers now felt the rising pressure to live up to these bulbous hard-ons. Not only that, but multiple developers felt their time was mostly being spent trying to wow the outside world at events like E3, rather than building an actually good game. In 2019, CDPR made a public pledge in an interview with Kotaku that it will treat its employees more humanely, which, I mean, <laughs> It's a real article title, huh? While famous for giving us, the gaming public, loving smooches and dainty cakes for a reasonable price, their developers routinely caught the flat part of the sharp end of the tip of the iceberg when it came to excessive workloads. Nights and weekends were routinely sacrificed at the altar of good Metacritic score, please, back in their Witcher days. And co-founder Marcin Avinsky wanted to let it be known that this would no longer be the case. Or rather that this would still be the case, except that they were now non-obligatory. Marchin wouldn't promise to actively limit crunch, instead hoping that a public statement on the matter would give their employees the confidence to tell their managers to go milk their prostate if they ever asked them to stay late. Stay tuned to find out whether or not this bold statement holds up. Later that year, CDPR managed to top the previous year's E3 presentation by pulling out their trump card, Keanu Reeves. Internet messiah and all-around person, Keanu was announced as a major supporting character in a cinematic trailer that weirdly spoils a pretty major moment in the game's story. Keanu then took to the stage and wowed the E3 going public with his humble charisma, mentioning something about bread making, I think, and announcing the game's release date the 16th of April, 2020. Fuck. Back in the whimsical land of Poland, reality quickly set in. One guy thought it was a joke, while others started making some no doubt hilarious and dank memes, joking about how long it would take for them to delay. Like my bulls in a goth bimbo's hydraulic press machine, everybody was waiting for the crunch. And they got it. In January 2020, both of these developer predictions came true. The game was delayed five months to September 17th and they would have to start crunching. In a call with investors, they clarified that it is in a fully playable state, just missing bug fixes and Polish, ironically. They also seemed very confident about their September release date. Well, that was until China has identified the cause of the mysterious pneumonia outbreak. This is an evolving situation. Literally every day we learn a little bit more about it. New cases are skyrocketing faster now than last spring. Look, I'm sick of hearing about COVID as much as you, but it is unfortunately relevant to the story. Come June 2020 and the pandemic ravaging this great nation of ours, CDPR understandably decided to push things back a bit further. Interestingly, however, they stated in an investor call that while the virus was certainly impacting production, it wasn't the main reason for their delay. Due to the sheer scale of the game, bug fixes and polish were taking much longer than anticipated, and the female eyeshadow team was still months away from creating the perfect woman. When asked what their plans were, if they had to delay a third time, they assured investors that they hadn't even considered that because the third delay wasn't even on the table, or the floor, or any adjacent ledges either. November 19th was to be their final release date. End of story. The delay to December 10th was almost entirely due to last-gen performance issues, according to CDPR. The PC and next-gen versions were ready to release, supposedly. COVID wasn't helping, and they admitted that they probably should have tested more playable builds earlier. December 10th was to be their final release date. Oh, 
They actually did release it on December 10th. I wonder how it turned out. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, you're right. Some vehicles play hard to get, while others came back like an excited dog. A new power move was invented. Keanu Reeves was consulted on motorbikes, but something got lost in the translation. Awkward hug rejection ejection technology. B bit of space on this side. Okay, reverse. Oh no, sir, sir, watch out. Oh, he's got his, uh, he's got his ear pods in. This is too much. Oh, I don't actually have any problem with this. This one looks normal to me. So the launch was not quite perfect. But while next generation and PC had a satisfactory, although buggy performance, last gen was a mess. Models took several seconds to load, even as you were standing right in front of them. Frame rate struggled especially during important story moments. And don't get me started on the sheer number of crap. The outlets reviewing the game before its release were only provided PC versions, the best version of the game, and told they weren't allowed to use their own footage either, only B-roll footage provided to them from CDPR. Now, after people saw the game's poor performance, CDPR put out a statement saying, look, you can get a full refund if you like, no strings attached. But that just led many people to believe that they had a special deal with retailers. They didn't. Other gamers were at the mercy of Sony and Microsoft's standard refund policy. In response to the massive wave of people demanding their money back, Sony pulled the game from their online store entirely, and it still isn't back to this day. I mean, curious, what's the date? Uh, I think it's the... To today! Can you believe it? Microsoft, on the other hand, decided just to put a passive-aggressive warning on the game's page. That's not all. People were reportedly having seizures from one of the game's special mechanics. Well, that one has to get patched out. A special streamer mode that disabled copyright music didn't disable all the copyrighted music, and streamers were getting flagged. <coughs> and... There was a poor, limited edition Xbox One X console that, when it was released, could barely play the game. But other than that, it was pretty fun. CDPR has made it very clear that they're desperate to win back over the hearts and minds of gamers worldwide. And for what it's worth, I do believe them. In their apology video, the management staff take full responsibility for the shoddy release which resonates with the Glassdoor reviews that mentioned headstrong, cocky managers who refused to listen to their developers. While this is purely speculative, I believe they shipped when they did, because any further delays would have pushed it into early or mid-2021, missing the incredibly lucrative holiday season. This would have affected not just them, but their relationship with distributors and retailers, who were no doubt banking on what was to be a massive launch. It's also entirely possible that, while they brag about being solely driven by quality due to being self-published, their status as a publicly traded company would have meant investors and shareholders were placing heat on management to release the game so they can get a return on their money. Whatever the reason, one major bug fix patch has dropped so far, and while last gen frame rate still dips to the sort of numbers that would get Call Me Carson excited, it is slowly becoming the experience that it should have been at launch. A second patch was scheduled for late February until they were- This is me hacking into your video to get you to shut the fuck up for a second and to segue into the next part. The patch was locked and loaded and ready to be dumped onto everybody's sex boxes. However, a group of internet trolls with a sense of humor and vernacular of a 13 year old in 2012 decided it'd be a good idea to break past CD Projekt's not so secure firewall and steal some pretty important source codes. On February 8th of this year, CDPR tweeted out an important update and many people knew that they were really serious because it wasn't delivered on the typical dehydrated piss yellow. The update in question informed the masses that the company fell victim to a cyber attack and the culprits made away with a bunch of information regarding day-to-day -day business, the source codes for Cyberpunk 2077, Witcher 3, an unreleased version of The Witcher 3, and even Gwent. Wow. But honestly, who gives a fuck about Gwent? The note left by the bandits made sure to inform CDPR that they had been quote, epically pwned, and that they had 48 hours to reach an agreement. Following this update, CD Projekt did make sure to clarify that their employees were not affected by this attack. However, as for the source codes, they probably should have paid up. An auction did go up for some or all of the stolen source code, however, a lot of what I've seen is pretty vague about what was sold, but I doubt they would disclose that sort of thing. And the auction did end up closing, which means that somebody out there must have the source codes to Pan Am's but, you know, if you do, 
email me. Of course, this caused a delay for the patch itself since their IT departments had to clean staff's computers to make sure there wasn't any residual viruses or malware that could cause more problems for them, thus in turn slowing down work on the patch which was supposed to be the big fix for a lot of players' issues with the game. CDPR's legacy with Cyberpunk 2077 really was a series of unfortunate events and this one's no different. This is just the, the shit-flavored cherry on top of the fucking enemy Sunday, and I guess you could say they were definitely epically pwned. Don't in on that. This is me hacking, but in reverse to go back to many kudos. We can only hope that CDPR makes good on their promise to right their wrongs. But for many people, the damage is done. While this was an especially tough lesson, perhaps gamers will finally learn to never look up to or trust anyone or anything ever again. Gamers have always been persecuted, and Cyberpunk was no exception. Check out this video with Ordinary Things to see what happened the last time we decided to rise up.